can't really make broad generalizations about what a specific value would be out here. My rule of thumb is if we are at the mouth of the bore, anything from that point out is a triviality, is, is not worth thinking about from a clinical standpoint, the exposure. This one is kind of right at the mouth of the bore, so. Um, but you would have to look at it based on each individual uh, magnet system. And I, I should mention that if you're looking at like the ultra short bores, uh, like the Siemens Esprit, um, because those systems are so much shorter, the RF coil is actually closer to the, that mouth of the bore. So whereas here, near the mouth of the bore, we're at 2% of whatever the volume is, or whatever the, the exposure is in the middle. Um, for the Esprit, and, and Siemens hasn't provided information in model the, these systems, so this is speculation and, and guesswork on my part. Um, but I would expect that it's maybe 10%, 0 0.1 instead of point, uh, 0 0.02 um, for, the, for the ultra short bore. Um, there aren't a whole lot of those systems still in use, um, so it's probably not a, a significant concern. So when you're scanning off label, what are the forces involved? Again, our three forces are three buckets of potential risk, static field, time varying gradients, and radio frequency. Um, we can look at where the implant is within the body of the patient, how we're gonna position the patient inside the magnet, and so then we have an idea, we have an understanding of where the implant is relative to the forces um, inside. What are the forces, what are their magnitudes as they affect the, the implanter device? We do not care what the maximum potential value is for a scanner. If you have a spatial gradient, um, you have an implanter device that says 720 gauss per centimeter, but your system goes up to 1100 gauss per centimeter, that doesn't matter doesn't matter what the maximum for the system is. What matters is what the implant or device will be exposed to. So understanding that spatial distribution and, and the values is incredibly important. Um, if you are going off label, one of the questions that I feel you should be asking yourself is, what are the potential harms? What if I do exceed a value? If, if you have a patient who has an implanted bone growth stimulator, bone growth stimulators work by essentially um, issuing uh, an electric stimulation to uh, the bone growth, bones to, to stimulate growth. Um, if we exceed the time varying gradient threshold, they have a slew rate of 80 tesla per meter per second, and you can't limit your system's slew rate, and your system maybe goes up to 150 tesla per meter per second for the, for the slew rate. Do you not give it to that patient? Ask yourself, what are the potential harms? What does, um, what does time varying gradient do? What's the biological effect of time varying gradient? Neurostimulation, stimulation. We, we induce an electrical current that, that triggers a uh, neuromuscular response. A bone growth stimulator uses electrical currents to stimulate bone growth. If we happen to induce a current in this lead, in this device, that goes into the bone, what might happen? What are, what's the potential harm of that? we might stimulate bone growth. We might do exactly what that implant is in place to do if we exceed this. Now, there's also the potential that you know, we could um, 
induce voltages into the device that might damage or disable the device. But lots of times, bone growth stimulators are just left in the patient long after they've done their job and they have ceased to function. So if we damage the device that no longer functions in the first place, is that a harm? Just because we exceed the MR conditional threshold does not necessarily mean that we produce harm. Ask yourself, once you've identified the forces that are involved, what are the potential magnitudes of exposure? If you are above and beyond an MR conditional label, this is essentially asking the question, so what? So what if I'm above and beyond this? What damage does that potentially do? This is important because we may discover that the, the potential harm for a piece of shrapnel, uh, embedded metal or something like that, is we might give the patient a bruise or temporary soreness or inflammation. Is that enough to warrant canceling the study? Uh, if we look at what the potential benefit of the study is and we weigh it against the potential harms, then we can make an educated decision. And we're not, we're not relegating ourselves to a does it match the conditions? If so, we can do the study. If not, we can't do the study. If you identify risks, is there anything you can do to mitigate those risks? Can you modify the, the study, change the pulse sequences, reduce a flip angle? Um, uh, while you can't really quantify it, if your scanner has silent mode or quiet modes, um, that dramatically reduces the, the gradient level. It won't tell you how much it reduces it by. Um, but if you have potential concerns about it and you know that one option is significantly less than the other option, even if you can't assign numbers to it, that may be enough to, to give you a level of comfort to proceed with the study of doing a silent scan protocol um, if you're concerned about gradient uh, related forces. Uh, so there, there are things that you are able to do to, to address and mitigate some of these risks. Lastly, I'm going to give you a set of recommendations. Um, for safety, I am of the opinion that when we say that safety is everybody's job, it's nobody's responsibility. Um, so I would encourage every one of you, when you get back to your facilities, if you don't currently have um, an MR safety officer who is sort of parallel or equal to your radiation safety officer, um, your facility, I would encourage you to have one. Similarly, um, I believe that every hospital that has an MR should have a physician who is in charge of MR safety from a clinical standpoint, an MR MD, an MR medical director. Um, if you have a medical physicist who is involved in MR, um, if presently they only feel comfortable addressing the image quality related issues, ask them to kind of push their boundaries and ask them to become more involved in MR safety and, and become more familiar with it uh, because a well-informed medical physicist um, is an incredible asset when assessing the potential risks and complications of complicated situations. Patients who have 12 different implants that you're not sure if they agree or disagree with one another or they complicate one another. Um, so please implement the, the structure of MR medical director, MR safety officer, MR safety expert at your facility. Um, now I'm a member of the ABMRS, so I'm big on certification, um, but even if you ignore certification, um, I would encourage you to get people trained specifically for these roles. Um, and then not only those individuals, um, but make sure that that knowledge becomes diffused through your organization and that the, the pieces that the named individuals learn, um, that they 
institutionalize that knowledge. They translate it into policies and procedures. They translate it into staff training programs um, to help make sure that that knowledge becomes part of your hospital's practice. Um, if there's an interest in the credentialing or certification piece of it, um, the ABMRS uh, will administer the exam uh, wherever there are sufficient numbers to, to, uh, to do that. Um, we've done, apart from all of the exams we've done in the States, um, we've done two separate exams in Australia, and this summer we just did uh, an exam in London. Um, so um, as long as, as there are sufficient numbers, um, ABMRS will administer the certifying exams anywhere in the world. Um, with that, I'll take any questions in the limited time we have, just a few minutes before we break for lunch. Are there any remaining questions? Yes? Uh, do we always need to ask for a report if they think the type of implant? Do you always need to ask for information about the specific type of implant? Yes. Um, for, for example, if we have uh, an orthopedic screen or plate in the, in the legs and we are scanning the number of spikes. So orthopedic hardware is a great example. Um, I am only aware of um, two uh, statements of what I'll call um, grouped um, or categorical um, clearances. Um, and these are from Dr. Kanal and Dr. Schalk. Um, Dr. Kanal has said that he views all coronary stents um, as presumed to be MR conditional, MR safe. That, that he does not have his staff look them up. Dr. Schellick has said the same thing, except he's gone uh, a step further, and he has said that he also applies that to all coronary valve replacements. Um, those two are the only individuals that I know of that have sort of publicly asserted a categorical um, uh, safety statement for all implants or devices of, of a specific type. I do know that there are a number of facilities that, to your question about orthopedic implants, I do know a number of facilities where um, uh, the supervising physician has, internal to the organization, made a categorical statement about all orthopedic implants and devices are presumed safe. Um, I don't know of anybody else sort of in the broad community who has made that statement publicly, you know, for, for everybody. Um, I only know about the, the two related to coronary stents and, per Dr. Schellick, uh, uh, valve replacements. Um, those are the only ones that I know of that, that have kind of put that out there publicly. What, what if it is necessary to, to, to make the report uh, specifying the, the type of companion? But we are scanning a part of the body that will not, that will not expose the metals or, or, or the, the part that has the, the metals to the, right. to the type of risks in the model. So I would, in my opinion, there is only one implant or device that for me is a red light, categorical, no way, I will not consider. And that's an unidentified cerebral aneurysm clip. Everything except unidentified cerebral aneurysm clips, I think is worth investigating, worth uh, uh, doing a risk benefit analysis. If, if the implant or device is outside the, the static field, the spatial gradient, the RF, the, the gradients, um, based on the specific conditions, I personally am not concerned about gradient energies acting on an orthopedic implant. What's it going to do? Is it, what's it going to stimulate? It's bolted into the bone. You know, I, I don't see a potential risk for uh, time-varying gradient exposure to an orthopedic implant. 
Is there a potential for radio frequency heating? Yes, there is the potential. I think it's unlikely um, in, in most conditions. Um, so I would probably, personally, I would be fairly permissive in terms of RF exposure to an orthopedic implant. Static magnetic field, um, as long as I don't have a, a, a concern about the underlying condition of the bone to which it's attached, um, if, if I think the bone is solid, I think the anchorage into the bone is, is reliable, um, then what if it was cast iron and it was subjected to translational or rotational forces? It's bolted into the bone of that patient. Um, as long as the bone is healthy, um, I, I don't see that as a particular risk. So I personally would not uh, advocate for a categorical exemption for orthopedic hardware, but I'd be awfully close to it. I, I would be very permissive in terms of, of my view of the potential risks for each of the three categories.